Hello and welcome everybody to today's Lunchbox Talk. Um, we're thrilled to uh, wrap up the year with uh, a special Lunchbox Talk on Protect Our Pollinators, Become a Community Scientist with Bud Burst. My name is David Michaud. I'm the Registrar and Program Coordinator here at the Botanical Garden. I'll be on the chat if you need anything, uh, those of you on Zoom and anyone in the room here today. Um, if we have questions for our presenter today, we'll be moderating those. I would also like to thank our Fall 2022 Lunchbox Talk event host, Tom Keenan, for supporting our Fall Lunchbox Talk series at the Long League level. Lunchbox Talk event hosts provide funds that support program planning, accessibility, and reach of these talks. I'd also like to thank all of you for joining us uh, for this program. We have folks joining on Zoom from all across the Carolinas, from Rocky Mountain, North Carolina to Rock Hill, South Carolina, and from Haywood County out west to New Hanover County down east. So thank you all for attending today. I'd like to move on to introducing our speaker today. Lauren Green is my office mate and is our uh, youth environmental education specialist. Lauren has experience teaching environmental education and science in both informal and formal education settings. Prior to the Botanical Garden, Lauren worked as an elementary environmental education consultant for the Center for Public Engagement with Science um, oh, with science with the UNC Institute for the Environment. Prior to that, she was a science specialist at Forest View Elementary in Durham and taught earth science and biology at Green Hope High School. She has a Master of Education in Science Education, her North Carolina Environmental Education Certification, and is a Georgia Master Naturalist. Lauren has worked in a variety of environmental education positions, including as the Program Manager at Dunwoody Nature Center, Camp Leader at Duke Gardens, and Program Director at the Red Wolf Coalition. She lives in Durham, where you can find her, her husband, and her dog working and playing in their yard. Thanks for being with us today, Lauren. Thank you, David, and welcome, everyone. Let's jump right in. All right. So today, I'm going to talk briefly about pollinators, pollination, climate change, and phenology before we delve into what you can do and science can do to help our pollinator friends um, by collecting data for bud burst. So, what's so great about flowers? They smell good, they look pretty, and they're also a good source of food. So for pollinators, those sources of food would be the pollen is protein, and the nectar as carbs. Many plants produce brightly colored, smelly flowers to attract animals like bees. But why would a plant want to attract animals that eat their nectar and pollen? Why, pollination, of course. Pollination is the transfer of pollen from the pollen-producing part of a flower, the stamen, to the seed producing part of the flower, the pistil, resulting in fertilization and seed production. As you can see from these images, you can see the bee moving pollen from one flower to the next, and then that flower producing fruit with seeds inside and those seeds then growing into a seedling. So all of these pictures show pollinators. Pollinators are animals that help plants reproduce by pollination. Pollination is necessary for reproduction. 85% of the world's flowering plants are pollinated by our pollinators rather than wind or water. More than 75% of our crop species are pollinated by pollinators. So our pollinators are pretty important friends out there. We're going to get to know a few of them today. First up, we're going to get to know bees a little better. Bees are flying insects. The females have stingers, and they are often furry. So up next is your first quiz. We're going to play two truths and a lie. Which do you think is a lie. There we go. All right, so yeah. number one, there are over 20,000 known species of bees in the world. So that one's true. Yay. 
Number two, about one in every three bites of food we eat come from crops pollinated by bees. Also true. Number three, honeybees are not the best pollinators for tomatoes. So honeybees are actually from Europe. They are the type of bee that most of us are most familiar with. They have yellow and black stripes, and they often have pollen baskets on their hind legs. Going back to our question, bumblebees are actually the best pollinator for tomatoes. Honeybees often get all the credit for pollination, but they aren't the best pollinator for every kind of plant. So bumblebees are an example of a native pollinator. We have lots of native pollinators that are often overlooked and understudied. We have over 4,000 native bee species in the United States and over 500 here in North Carolina. Native pollinators do not just include bees. Native pollinators and plants have had time to evolve a special relationship. Native pollinators are well adapted to finding these native plants and foraging from them for nectar and pollen. The plants are well adapted to attracting these pollinators and providing them with the resources they like. So pictured here, we have our monarch butterfly, rosy maple moth, eastern tiger, swallowtail butterfly, and ruby-throated hummingbird. These are all native pollinators in North Carolina. So let's get to know those butterflies and moths a little better. They start life as caterpillars. They're flying insects with two pairs of large membranous wings. All right, get ready for your next quiz. All right. To truth and a lie, we've got number one, adult butterflies only eat nectar. Number two, butterflies and moths generally cannot bite in their adult form. Number three, moths like to feed from bright white flowers they can easily see at night. All right, I'll give you three more seconds. Most of you got it right. We'll go through it just like last time. So, my computer takes, there we go. All right, yeah. number one is the lie. So, nectar is usually the most important food source for butterflies, but it's not their only food source. They also feed from dead animals, rotting fruit, blood, and poop for extra nutrients. Um, our butterflies and moths generally cannot bite in their adult form. Their mouth part is a straw-like long proboscis that you can see clearly in the two pictures. This is used to drink that nectar. And moths do prefer light-colored flowers. They can easily see at night, and also ones that usually emit a strong fragrance at night. As, um, as this is when moths are most active. Most moths. All right, we're going to get to know our hummingbird friends next. So these birds like brightly colored tubular flowers with lots of nectar. You might hear them before you see them. They hover in midair by rapidly flapping their wings, and their long bills and tongues are used to feed on nectar. In North Carolina, the ruby-throated hummingbird, pictured here, is our main species. We rarely see eight other species here in North Carolina, but generally, if you see a hummingbird here, it's gonna be a ruby-throated. They're abundant from April through September, but we do have a few that stick around year-round. All right, your third and last quiz. So find a lie. Number one, hummingbirds are the smallest birds in North America. Number two, hummingbirds need only a small amount of nectar to survive. Number three, 
hummingbirds are the only bird known to fly backwards. All right, clearly we know our pollinators. Most of you also got this one correct. So, number one is true. Hummingbirds are the smallest birds in North America. They weigh only 0.1 to 0.2 ounces, which is the equivalent of about the same weight as two to six M&Ms. Their wingspan is about three to four inches. Number two is our lie. Hummingbirds actually need about twice their weight in food every day. They also don't only eat nectar, but they will also eat insects. Number three is true. Hummingbirds are the only bird known to fly backwards. They can also hover and adjust their position up and down as well as backwards with precision. Along with those pollinators, there are other pollinators that you might meet when you're outside. Flies are pollinators as are wasps, some species of beetles, ants, and bats. There's just as much diversity in our pollinators as there is in our flowers. All right, we're going to pause briefly to see if anybody has any questions yet. David, do we have any questions on Zoom? No, no questions yet. Okay, good. We know our pollinators. We're ready to move on. All right, so why are we talking about pollinators? We're talking about pollinators because they are in peril. Many populations are de de declining due to habitat loss pesticides, and climate change. Like other animal, animals, pollinators need food, water, shelter, and space to reproduce. As we use more and more land, we're leaving less room for pollinators' favorite flowers. Pesticides typically kill any insect that they reach not specific to just the ones that you don't want in your yard. It wipes out everything. So when you're spraying for something like a mosquito, that spray is also likely to be killing our pollinator friends. As we saw, many of our pollinators are insects. And then we move on to climate change, another big issue that is our focus today. So climate change is a change in average conditions, such as temperature or rainfall, in a region over a long period of time. Earth's climate is warming due to the burning of fossil fuels and other human activity. This warming is changing when many plants produce flowers. So phenology is the study of the timing of annual or seasonal life cycle events. These seasonal changes in plants and animals are called phenophases. In animals, these would be things like migration and hibernation. Our picture here shows a silver maple as it goes from bud to flower to leafing out in seeds, to then reproducing and starting all over with a new seedling. So when a plant does all of these activities matters. This phenological data is what we're going to be talking about and how climate change is affecting that and our pollinators. So phenology is important because it's changed, it, it determines when food sources are available to humans and animals. It also deals with our seasonal allergies. And plants are very sensitive to climate, so observing them can tell us how the climate is changing. All right. Um, all right, so this slide shows us that using data that's been collected, the timing of spring is changing. The warmer temperatures are arriving earlier, which means that plants are leafing out and flowering earlier in the spring due to these shorter, warmer winters. Right now, spring is starting three days earlier. By 2050, with projections using this data, it'll be 13 days earlier. 
by 2100, it'll be 21 days earlier. And that's so, globally, is that what Yes, that's globally. Um, the data that this is using, I'm not certain if it's global data or just here in the US, but these trends are, are shown um, globally, yes. Um, so I personally prefer warm weather to cold weather, but this warming and this changing of when the seasons is happening is having negative impacts. All right, so the warming world equals earlier springs. These changes in plant phenology can have far reaching effects on other aspects of the ecosystem. If a plant blooms earlier, they're more likely to experience late frost. They can kill their flowers and harm fruit production. This in turn reduces food availability for humans and animals. An early spring bloom can also affect that plant's pollinators who may not become active until later in the year. This can cause pollinators to miss out on an important food resource and interfere with the plant's reproduction. Early spring growth and blooming can also increase the severity of seasonal allergies. Overall, we know that these impacts are happening, but we need more data to know exactly how different species in different locations are being affected. Yes. So why wouldn't the insects also come out early if there's, you know what I'm saying? Yes, so the question is, why wouldn't the insects be coming out early as well as the plants? So flower bloom time, and insect activity and other pollinator activity is not just determined by temperature, it also can be determined by length of day and other factors. So you might have a mismatch of um, hummingbirds headed north because the day has gotten longer, but their flowers are already blooming and haven't been pollinated and we're getting less of that. So then overall, we're gonna get less and less of the flowers that they prefer. Make sense? Yeah. And then also, isn't light pollution uh, impact pollinators? Yes, light especially. Yeah. Yes, light pollution is another factor. You are correct. Um, all right. <coughs> so this is where you start getting involved. Um, what is community science? Community science is often also called citizen science participatory science, collaborative science, or neighborhood science. It's the public involvement in inquiry and discovery of new scientific knowledge. So community science is fantastic because anyone can participate. Everyone is using the same protocol so the data can be combined and be high quality. That data that everyone is collecting can then be used by real scientists to come to real conclusions. And this helps all of us build our scientific literacy and identity. Um, SciStarter is a fantastic website. It's a clearinghouse of citizen science projects. There are so many citizen science projects out there to choose from. If Budverse that we're gonna talk about next doesn't strike a chord with you, please check out SciStarter and see if there's something else that interests you. Frogwatch, iNaturalist, and eBird are just a few of the other projects that are out there. But today, we're going to be talking about Budburst. Um, so Budburst is a community science project based at the Chicago Botanic Garden with participants from all 50 states. It was started in 2007 as Project Budburst, and it moved to the Chicago Botanic Garden in 2017. The overall goal is to understand how plants and the larger ecosystem are being affected by human impacts on the environment. Budburst researchers do this with the help of community members like you who are collecting this data and sharing it with them. So Budburst has multiple projects. The one we're going to be talking about is pollinators and climate, um, which is aiming to understand how plants and their pollinators are responding to a changing climate. All right, 
So the North Carolina Botanical Garden is participating in a partner hub, hub project with Budhurst. This project um, includes four other botanic gardens, the Denver Botanic Garden, San Diego Botanic Garden, and the Houston Botanic Garden. So we're all working together to spread the word about Budhurst and community science. We're working directly with Budhurst to run programs with our community partners. So the partners that we have here at North Carolina Botanical Garden are the Chapel Hill Public Library, Edible Campus UNC, Hargraves Community Center, Museum of Life and Science, and the Triangle Land Conservancy. So we'll be offering Budweiser's programs to all of these organizations to the community to give you more opportunities to learn about Budweiser's and actually participate and go outside when it's not 40 something degrees and raining and there might be pollinators flying around unlike today. Um, all right. So I'm going to pause here to see if there are any questions yet before we delve into how you can participate in the Pollinators and Climate Project with Bud First. Any questions yet, David? No. Okay. Good. I'm doing great there. Next part, you might have questions. It's okay. Um, all right. So, Pollinator Research with Bud First. So, to participate, there are several steps that you'll need to take. I'm going to go through all of this very well, very thoroughly. Um, but please let me know if you have any questions. So the steps are to choose a plant with flowers to observe. You're gonna count pollinator visits for two to 10 minutes. You're gonna identify pollinators using bud burst pollinator groups. And then you're gonna report your data to answer, help answer a question critical to pollinator conservation. So you're gonna be looking at what plants have what pollinators on them and how many. All right, so our first step is to choose a plant with flowers to observe. So we have chosen this plant, which is a black-eyed Susan, a native species. So the first thing we're gonna to need to record is that name. Um, they do want that species name. In the app, there's iNaturalist to help you identify it if you're filling it out on paper and then putting it on their website. You can Google it. Um, plus, there's iNaturalist and other sources to help you identify plants. But it also makes sense to try to pick a plant that you recognize or know, or at least know enough about it that you can identify it. Next, you're going to identify its flowering stage. Is it early, mid, or late? So early means that there are only a few, less than 5% of the flowers have emerged. Middle, the majority of flowers have emerged, or late. Most or less, more than 95% of flowers have wilted or fallen off. So for our <coughs> black eyed Susan here, we would say this is middle. The majority of the flowers have emerged. Next, we're going to count the number of open flowers or flower heads. As some of us know, some flowers are actually composite flowers and they have these tiny little flowers and we're not expecting anybody to try to figure that out. So the composite flowers are going to equal that flower head. And why is this information important? We're getting there. Okay. Um, all right, so if we look at this flower, it's a little hard to tell from the picture, but there are 21 open flowers on our Black Eyed Susan here. We then have the option of collecting height data um, that would need to be in centimeters. All right, so we've got our plant picked out. Next, we're gonna count our pollinators. So we're gonna watch our plant for two to 10 minutes and count the number of times you see a pollinator visit your plant. This is why we went over pollinators, so you know what you're looking for. We're gonna go into a little bit more about what a visit is. 
you're going to be identifying your pollinators using bud burst pollinator groups. So you have choices. You can choose to do their basic identification where you're just choosing bees and other butterflies and moths, hummingbirds, or you don't know. Or you can use the advanced, which is the seven different groups that you can see indicated by the seven different circles. So you're breaking out your bees and other into more specific groups. You're then going to report the data you've collected, either by filling out that printable page and then uploading that information onto budburst.org or by using the mobile app. We'll talk more about the mobile app shortly. All right, so what counts as a visit? So a pollinator must touch at least one open flower for it to count. If it touches a leaf, doesn't count. If that same pollinator leaves the plant for more than 10 seconds and then returns, touching at least one of the flowers, this counts as another visit. So we're gonna go through some examples to help clarify this. All right, so our bee friend here lands on a leaf. It's not a visit, doesn't count. Now our bee lands on the flower, it's one visit. That bee lands on the flower and then moves to another flower on the same plant, it's still one visit. As long as it's on that same plant that you're observing, it's just one visit, even though it's going from flower to flower. Part of that is just to make your life easier because it would be much harder to keep track of all this if you're having to count every time a bee lands on an individual flower. <laughs> all right, if that bee lands on the flower, leaves, and then comes back, that's two visits. So it's gotta leave for at least 10 seconds so that it really leaves the plant then it's two visits. It's also two visits if you've got two different pollinators touching that flower or a flower. So if the butterfly went to a different flower than the bee, still two visits as long as you've got two pollinators on that one plant. We get more bees, now we've got four visits. All right, so if we're looking at that basic, again, here's the paper version on the screen for you of what all you'd be filling out to practice your observation. So we've chosen this plant. So we're gonna start out at the top, writing down our name, where we are, the date, the temperature. You can check your phone or check the internet later. The cloud cover, just look up. How specific does the location have to be? Um, not super. So if you're using the app, you can let it collect location data for you. Otherwise, you could just say North Carolina Botanical Garden. Um, or you could put in a street address. Okay. Doesn't have to be, I'm at the corner of Building B at the North Carolina Botanical Garden, looking at the, so just, general place, they just want to be able to get a general idea. All right, so you're going to record your plant name. So our plant is a non-native plant. It's a grape hyacinth. They want you to put down the scientific name because common names are often confusing as there's many plants out there with more than one common name. Um, so our scientific name is Muscari or Minicum. Um, you can choose to give your plant a nickname. So if I've decided I'm going to observe this particular grape hyacinth in my yard every day for a week, then I might name it grape hyacinth by tree because I'm also gonna observe a different grape hyacinth that's in my backyard. So I wanna be able to remember which is which and where I'm making my observations. It's totally an option. Kind of depends on what your plans are for your plants and your observations. Again, you have the option of getting that plant height. You're going to then count the number of open flowers, which we're not going to do right now. Um, 
you can see on this flower at the top, we have some buds that haven't opened fully, and then down at the base, some wilted flowers. Um, we're going to pick our flowering stage, though, which I would say is middle. We've got quite a few open flowers. And then we're going to go on to making our, collecting our data. So for between two and 10 minutes, you're going to observe your plant. You're going to write down your start time. You're going to tally up each pollinator that you see, whether it's a bird, a butterfly, or moth. Be your other. So you've got those three groups to tally in. When you're done, you'll record your end time. So whether you're using the paper or the app, this is the same information that you're collecting. Um, if you're using the paper, you're then going to go online to record that information. All right. We're going to practice with a video. All right. So if we're watching our little bee here, we have one visit so far. We have a honeybee on our hyacinth. We're watching our bee. We're only watching it for about 40 seconds. Oh, oh, wait. Oh, that's the same plant. It's still one visit. It hasn't changed plants. We're counting everything we see here as one plant. So it's one visit. It's on the same plant. Oh. So that would be one visit. So um, we collected one visit from bees and other for our practice observation. All right, moving on. Yes, Michael. If you observe zero insects, do they want to know that too? They do. Great question. Um, so if no pollinators visit your flower during your time watching it, please report zero. Zero is super important information for scientists. Um, it may not be as exciting to watch a flower with no pollinators visiting it. Um, I think it's still lovely, but they want that information, whether it's zero pollinators, one pollinator, or 100 pollinators. And then the time, what if you go over to them? Um, I believe it's okay if you go over 10 minutes. Um, you're recording that start and end time. It's a minimum of two minutes. Um, after 10 minutes, you're going to find that it's been long. It's going to feel like it's been longer than 10 minutes, so you might be done at that point anyway. Um, but you can do this as often as you want. Um, so you can do this every hour if you feel like it. Um, all right, so this is showing us um, the other paper option, showing the seven different pollinator groups. And then Budburst also has a pollinator group paper handout. These we will make sure that people on Zoom get a link to. It's all available on the Budburst website. I have paper versions here for those who came in person. Um, and that pollinator group handout gives you a little bit of identification information. On the back, it also has some of our common native bees. All right, some tips for observing. So make sure you're in a safe area. You're gonna to wanna to sit or stand quietly a few feet away and avoid casting a shadow. You don't want them to think you are a predator coming to eat them. You might find that binoculars or a hand lens or even the zoom on your phone's camera can be helpful in getting a closer look. You want to make sure that it's warm enough for pollinators to be active when you make your observations. Um, if it's spring or fall, midday when it's sunny and warm is going to be our best time during the summer. It is nice and warm all day long, so pollinators are going to become active pretty early. Um, you just want to make sure that there's pollinator activity happening so that you're getting good information collected. You don't want to look or smell too much like a flower. You don't want to get the pollinators coming at you instead of the flowers. So maybe it's a good day not to, to add those nice essential oils smelling like lavender and then the bees are coming to you instead of their flowers. Um, generally, it's recommended for ages uh, for collecting data for high school and up, but any age can really do this with help. So if it's a high school and up, 
they can handle this younger than that, make sure you're giving them a little bit more guidance. Patience is key. And as we just mentioned, no visits are fine. It's still important data to add that zero. If there is like a swarm, I mean, you know, tens, dozens of uh, pollinators on the plant, I've seen that in my garden. So um, maybe, I don't know, just guess. Yeah, so I would think uh, that'd be hard to count. Yeah, so the question is about if you've got a lot of pollinator activity. So you're gonna do the best you can. So remember you've counted the number of flowers on your plant, um, and I would recommend starting with an easier plant than a harder one. Start with one with fewer flowers, so you're gonna have fewer pollinators. Um, when we were practicing this earlier this fall, we were looking at asters and goldenrod, as that was what was in bloom, and they have a lot of flowers. Um, so one, it was challenging to count the flowers. If you um, are looking at a plant that has more than 100 flowers, they're not expecting you to count every flower. Once you reach 100, you can start estimating by 50s. Um, but even then, you might have an aster with 200 flowers. Um, or goldenrod. Yeah, or goldenrod. So then you're going to do the best you can to count those pollinators. Um, that might be an instance where you're not going to, you're going to count everyone you see on the plant and try to catch who's leaving and coming back. Um, but yes, it can be challenging, which is why you're gonna to wanna to start with a, a simpler plant with less flowers and work your way up to those more challenging ones. Um, yes? You could also take a picture. You wouldn't like count them at that moment, but you could then return to the picture and say, okay, there were 35 on them at this point in time to help. Can you upload pictures to the app? So um, for our Zoom audience, I'm going to kind of repeat what y'all just said. So um, we had a suggestion that uh, you can always take a picture of the plant with pollinators on it um, using that paper and count the pollinators to start um, and use the, your phone and the camera to help you collect your, your information as you're going along. Um, if you're on the app, you're uploading a picture of the plant to start with to identify the plant. Um, but you're not uploading pictures with the pollinators. So it's up to you to count those pollinators as best you can. You're doing the best you can. Um, and again, doesn't have to be challenging. You can find something with fewer flowers to get started and, and work your way up to harder and harder plants over time. All right. We're going to go through um, the app. Just quickly to, to show you what it looks like. Um, the app is available on both uh, Apple and the Google Play Store, so everyone can get it. One of the nice things about Budburst is they've translated all their materials into Spanish, so whether you're on their website, their app, or using their paper handouts, you can get those in Spanish or in English. Um, using location services on your phone makes it easier to answer that location question. Again, this is what it looks like when you go to download the Bud Burst app. Once you have the app, you're going to need to create a login. That login will work the same on your phone as on their website. So you'll be able to collect your data on your phone very easily. And then on their website, you can not only analyze your own data and see what you've collected, but on the website, you have access to everyone's data to see what pollinator activity looks like across the country. So once you have a login, you're gonna start out by taking a photo of the plant you've chosen. On the app, iNaturalist is built in, so once you've got a good photo, it's gonna give you some species suggestions. Um, when I did this um, with a uh, rosin weed, the first suggestions it gave me were not accurate, um, and I took a different picture and got a better list of suggestions. So it may not be the first suggestion, may not be the right one, but you can also click on the different plants and it'll give you a little bit more information and identification information so you can double check that that is the right plant. All right, then you are going to select your type of observation. 
So you'll have the option to pick phenology or pollinators. You're welcome to do either. Um, for our project, we're focusing on pollinators. You're then going to pick that location. And if you want, give your plant a nickname and click on the date. Going to record your weather conditions and your flowering stage of the plant. Count your flowers that are open. Measure the height if you choose. On that page, you've got to scroll down to type in the time you start your observation before clicking next. Once you've got your time in there, you're ready to start counting pollinators. On your phone, you're able to just click that plus button next to whichever type you're looking at. As you can see, you can pick basic, which looks like this, with your three different groups, and then I'm not sure. You can also choose the advanced, which will give you those seven groups and not sure, or expert, which is getting down to the species level. Um, we're not going to worry about that at this point, but if you feel confident, you go right ahead and try that expert level. Um, once you finish, you're going to record that end time. And then you also have the option to enter any notes. It could be anything that you want to add in there that's information. Um, maybe it's, you know, your flower is next to a hole, isn't a bed of flowers, um, and you see a lot of pollinator activity on the plants you didn't pick. Or it could be that a flock of birds flew over and all your pollinators disappeared. <laughs> Um, so anything that you want to add there, you are welcome to do so. So once you've collected that information, you then can view your plant card. So any observations you've taken on your phone, you'll be able to check out that data. So here's my observation. Starry rosin weed here at the garden um, shows where I found it. If I click on it, it'll give me more information about the plant and my information I collected. All right, any questions yet? Just about done. So Bud Burst has lots of more information and resources available on their web website, budburst.org. They also have a e-newsletter you can sign up for on their website, get more information from them on a regular basis. If you go to budburst.org slash pollinators dash climate, not what that says. Budburst.org slash pollinators dash and dash climate. You'll find more about that particular project as well as those printable data sheets and pollinator guide. You can always contact Budburst at info, info at budburst.org to have your questions answered. So if you're not sure about something, you want more information, you have any questions, you need anything, feel free to email them, that's what they are there for. All right. Now do we have any questions? What is the like big picture of the project? Are they trying to get counts and where they are and or you know what what does that mean in sort of terms of the future, I guess? Okay. So our question is kind of the why are they doing this? So as I mentioned, they've got multiple projects. This one is focused on pollinators and climate. So they're trying to collect as much information as they can about who's visiting what plant when and how is that changing over time. Okay. So Budburst, as I mentioned, started in 2007 um, with their phenology project. Uh, this pollinators and climate project is relatively new. Um, you can collect information once a day for a week and never again, or every month or every year. Um, you can collect information for them as much or as little as you choose. And that information is not just coming from you, it's coming from the community at large. That's the best thing about community science is you've got this pool of data coming in from all over. And then they can use that data and see, uh oh, we're seeing a change in this particular pollinator we need to do something to help that pollinator. It's in danger because there's some change happening that's affecting them. We need to look into that more. Um, or it might be, ooh, why is you know, this happening? So they're gonna be asking questions and 
and looking at things based on the information that we're getting to them. Any other questions? You're welcome to email me with questions as well. I'm happy to help out. L Green, don't forget the E at the end of green, at usc.edu. And I'm going to turn things back over to David. Well, thank you so much, Lauren. This was super inspiring. I hope to um, get to go out here in the garden and do some observations come spring, and I hope you at home will be able to do the same. Um, thank you, Lauren, for sharing our upcoming programs. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we are taking a break for the winter holiday. Uh, but we'll be back in action uh, come January, uh, about a month from, about five weeks from now, we'll have Scott Zona, um, a, a botanist and author, uh, sharing his new book, Gardener's Guide to Botany. Uh, and followed by a talk by our own Emma York Marzoff on increasing seeds for conservation needs. So I hope to see all of you at these upcoming programs. I posted some links in the chat for how to find registration for those programs. Uh, if you're not currently a member of the garden, uh, membership is critical to our mission. For those in the room, we have some packets over by the window. Uh, there's also a link in the chat for those of you at home. Uh, consider a gift membership in the giving season, uh, if you will. And um, Thank Lauren again so much for being here, and we'll see you next year.